Hello, BookTube. All right, we're continuing with this library tour. Uh, I'm on the footstool because we're on the top shelf of another bookcase. And we have one transverse book sitting way up on the top here, cocking all the others. <laughs> and this is Leslie Klinger's annotated edition of Dracula, which I found in a trade paperback. I think I got an advanced copy of this when it was first published. Uh, and I, I confess, just for durability's reasons, I would probably like a hardcover. Uh, but I found a paperback when I was out uh, uh, book shopping. I think I hauled it on this channel. And I, Dracula is one of those books that I just irrationally love. <laughs> so, I mean, rationally love, of course. It's a, it's a very entertaining novel, but also irrationally love, uh, where I just can't get enough of it, or I just can't get enough of the book. Uh, and I'm willing to get lots of editions. I have no idea how many editions there are in this room, but also lots of annotated editions as well, and illustrated editions and whatnot. Uh, I, the only defense that I can make for myself is that I don't do it with many books. It's, there aren't many books that are like that. Even the books that I love, I don't usually treat like that. So, uh, The only thing I don't like about it is that it shouldn't be transverse like this. It should have a place on a shelf. It's, I like it a lot more than a lot of... I like it and use it a lot more than a lot of the books that we've seen already, so I'll have to fix that when, when this is all over. Uh, then the next one is a big work of history. This is Robert Massey's Dreadnought, about the, the personalities involved, not just uh, at the top, but also all of the bureaucratic personnel involved in the massive arms race that led up to World War II, World War One, and it's just enthralling, just an amazingly well-told story. Such a huge book, and yet not a dull page anywhere in it. Uh, my only, I love it as a work of history, but my only question again is, what is it doing in here? <clears throat> when we were doing the history shelves out in the other room, I was showing you lots of history books that I love. Some more than I love this one. Why is this one in this room? Uh, but again, the library tour is one of the great ben fringe benefits is that you're rethinking your library as you do it. I hope. <laughs> I hope that at least that I am. Uh, this next one is, is a great thing. Just a great thing just in general. This is the Oxford Book of English Verse. This is the Helen Garden uh, edition, not uh, Quiller Cooch. And it's my favorite of all the Oxford Books of English Verse that have come out. Uh, absolutely indispensable as an anthology. I use it all the time. I pull it down off the shelf all the time just recently. Uh, because of Philip Sidney, <laughs> seeing how he's represented in the Oxford book. Uh, then this next one is, I have the paperback because I'm blurbed on it. Uh, but this is a book that I have praised on this channel many, many times. It's Matthias Bostrom's From Holmes to Sherlock. His big, sweeping cultural history of Sherlock Holmes as a cultural creation. On the page, on the stage, on the small screen, on the big screen. Uh, just wonderfully done. Again, like the well, Dreadnought, it's just personality-driven. Just wonderfully personality driven. If you are a Sherlock Holmes fan, you you've, and you, maybe you have a shelf of Sherlock Holmes books, you have to have this book. It's just so good. Uh, uh, okay, this next one is uh, from the University of Chicago Press. Uh, this is the complete works of Catherine Parr, the first woman ever to have a book printed under her own name in English, and also as a footnote, uh, Henry VIII's last wife. Uh, and this is an annotated collection of her works. Um, heavily annotated, lots and lots of critical apparatuses, of course, she would need with this sort of thing. She's not exactly a household name. Uh, um, and because I'm a big fan of Catherine Parr, <clears throat> I was very glad to get this finished trade paperback from the University of Chicago. Uh, but it wasn't the first copy that I had. The first copy that I had was a review copy, believe it or not. Chicago actually issued this as an ARC ever so long ago. And I had a friend who was working at a literary journal that got a copy of it. And as in most cases with, with you know, with uh, book reviews of literary journals and whatnot, uh, like with me, they get up to their eyeballs and review copies and sometimes give them away to staff. Uh, and <laughs> my friend grabbed the review copy of this and sent it to me. And I didn't keep the review copy once I got the actual finished trade paperback just properly through the mail. I didn't keep the review copy, but I did keep the sticker. There was a sticky note that was on the review copy that was sent to me. And it isn't distribute, it's simply toss. <laughs> Somebody in that editorial room decided this is just so boring that we're not even going to bother to try and give it away. We're just going to throw it out. <laughs> that review copy eventually made it to me and has has since made it to someone else. But uh, but I have the finished copy because it's, you know, it's nicer and it's more solid. Uh, Okay, this next one is an epic undertaking. Uh, I recommend the Oxford Book of English Verse, of course. You should have it if you're interested in poetry at all. I recommend From Holmes to Sherlock. 
if you have a Sherlock Holmes obsession or if you have a Sherlock Holmes collection of books, you really have to have that book. This book I recommend to all of you, <laughs> every single last one of you. This is 1,000 books to read before you die, and it is a big, gorgeous production. Just gorgeous, full of illustrations, full of uh, cover art, and uh, full of arguments. <laughs> you, won't get, you won't get more than 10 pages in here before you're arguing with the book. That's the glory of books like this. Uh, I was arguing with it, I reviewed it, and I, I loved it, but I argued with, of course, the, thing, the main thing you'll argue with here is not so much assessment of the books inside, but uh, what's included and what's not. And I was looking through the book. I read it and just loved it. But I was also looking for things, that big things, that were omitted. And I, I found a couple and griped about them. The main one for me being Seven Pillars of Wisdom by Lawrence of Arabia, which is not in there. Uh, but you're going to find stuff like that anyway. And you're also going to do what I did, which is to smile and cheer at the inclusion of stuff that you thought was obscure. So I, I really can't recommend this one highly enough. You should, you should get a copy. <laughs> uh, Okay, this is an author we've seen before. This is uh, Mark Giraud. He did a book, uh, a great book, on the life of the English country house. And this was a follow-up to that. This is a Victorian country house uh, that has, you know, it's the same kind of thing. You have plans, you have black and white photos, you have elaborate color photos of all of the, uh, the great surviving Victorian country houses and, and analyses of the roles that they played uh, in their societies, the things that went on there and whatnot, what Wilson Shugart got up to. <laughs> uh, I have a, a soft spot for that sort of thing, for English country houses. I've been in quite a few of them, stayed in quite a few of them, and uh, that's that explains this next one, too. This is just a, a, a big picture book uh, of the last country houses, the same thing. Uh, there are, this is, in, on one level, this is, of course, wrong. People make country houses today. They build them today. But they're hideous monstrosities, whereas we're talking about these older hideous monstrosities. And this is just, there are many, many, many versions of this sort of thing. I could, I could fill a whole bookcase with them. I don't know why I have this particular one. I just like to uh, consult and, and daydream. Uh, let's see here. This next one is, uh, oh, oh, fantastic. Oh, I thought this was buried in the other room. Oh, it, no, it's been in this room all along. Okay, well, it needs to be, I'm, I'm going to put it back on the shelf. It needs to be relocated. Uh, this is Helen Hokinson. This is My Best Girls, um, which is a collection of her, uh, her inimitable New Yorker cartoons, most of which involve her best girls, these, these, uh, mink stole tiny dog wearing, a uh, tiny dog carrying uh, totally oblivious and sweet as the day is long New York matrons who uh, still exist but, but they, we don't quite make fun of them anymore now, now in these they're immortalized forever and uh, some of these uh, some of these are uh, immortal I mean, some of them are, are in any New Yorker cartoon collection one or two of these will pop up uh, but I love them all uh, and I have another Helen Hokinson volume, uh, much earlier, we started much earlier in this book tour. Uh, and when I looked at that volume, I wondered about My Best Girls. I wondered where it was. I wrote a very affectionate uh, appreciation of, the, of these things. Uh, that I remember I'll leave a link to anything uh, down below. Uh, I, obviously the Helen Hokinson needs to be together. So, so I need to fix that right away. Uh, Okay, this next one is um, a Barnes & Noble classic. Uh, not leather-bound. This one is cloth-bound uh, with no dust jacket and with uh, illustrations by uh, uh, Mark Summers. And this is Moby Dick. And it is probably my favorite edition of Moby Dick. I, it's also a, an amazing demonstration of, what, of the wonderful thing that we've got going here on BookTube. It's only a matter of time until the larger YouTube gods realize what we're doing on booktube that we're making intensely human real connections and shut us down it's only a matter of time until that happens that's not only not productive for them monetarily but it's counter to their brand <laughs> but in the meantime i have another another copy of this that's all battered and faded and I, I held it up on camera years ago on this channel and i mentioned that it was probably my favorite edition of moby dick and that i wish that when i was working i was working at a barnes and noble when these came out and i wish i bought a whole stack of them uh, because this this cover does wear off, pulling it on and off the, the the shelf, it does wear off, and one of you found one and sent it to me. 
a total stranger you've never met. You sent it to me. So, uh, and this is, let me, let me show you some, uh, okay, <laughs> well, you open it, you open a copy of Moby Dick. If it's in my library, and this is what you find. <sighs> oh, I remember her like it was yesterday. Um, let me show you, a, yeah, there's Ahab. And there aren't many. There, there are color illustrations all throughout here, and it's just, just beautiful, just beautiful. Uh, again, I mean, I'm, I have it on the shelf now, right next to Dracula, and it's the same way. I have the same feeling towards Moby Dick, where I just can't get enough of it. I can't read enough about it. I can't get enough pretty or interesting editions. I love illustrated editions of Moby Dick. It doesn't uh, ah, okay. And then we have these last two books are uh, history. But they are weird history. They are, they are, these are not the same thing as Dreadnought, where I would never put these in the other room. Uh, there's a, a six, there was a six volume series about a hundred years ago by a journalist named Mark Sullivan called Our Times, in which he surveys everything. Hat fashions, hem lengths, popular songs, stage plays, catchphrases, the crowds at the art museum, history, biography, agriculture, everything. And he does it in such a wonderful way. And we, when we were doing the history tour, on the history wall uh, out in the other room, we saw a couple of Mark Sullivan volumes. Uh, and when when I was looking at them, I just hoped out loud that I had the ones that I really love, the volumes that I really love, in a durable hardcover in this room. It turns out both of those things are true. This is the 20s, and I reinforced it, and I, I uh, consult it. And then the next one, the one that I... Uh, for obvious reasons, for obvious Taft-related reasons, I consult the most, is uh, 1909 to 1914. And with these wonderful, uh, these wonderful Art Deco covers, I've never seen any of the other volumes with these dust jackets, corresponding dust jackets like these. I've never seen anything, any of them like it. So, uh, so I grabbed these two, I reinforced them, and uh, I have them here in this room. Uh, because they really give you a feeling in a way that even a good narrative history does not. They're, they're also lavishly illustrated, so you, you can see photographs and illustrations of everything that Sullivan's talking about. And it brings the time alive because it surrounds you in the day-to-day -day details that histories leave out. Uh, I, <laughs> I think they're fantastic. Uh, so there you go. That is the, the top shelf here, and the problem of the transverse book solved itself. Because Helen Hokinson is going with the other Helen Hokinson somehow or other by hook or by crook. So now there's no cocking going on on this top shelf. Uh, so we will move on to uh, the next shelf uh, tomorrow. And I'm hoping that, uh, that the next shelf is low enough so that I don't need this footstool. <laughs> so I will wrap this up. But I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.